The northern schools of Buddhism and the southern schools of Buddhism are very different. The climate, the geography, the background, the culture, the practice is very, very different. I cannot comment on the great southern countries where Buddhism has taken root, such as Cambodia and Thailand and, and, and Laos, all that. I cannot comment. I don't have an in-depth knowledge. But I can tell you about Tibet. In Tibet, shamanistic practice under the name of Penpo, shamanistic practice was very strong. It's very powerful. It is the leading practice. That is, worshipping ancestors, nature spirits, fairies, gnomes, demons, gods, devas. That was very strong, and it still is. And those gods and demons and, and, and all these types of um, beings, even spirits, dead spirits, people who have died, the worship is very strong, and you can get them to help you to get money, to get the, the lady that you love, to, to destroy your enemies, to create magic, that's what they're used for. Because shamanistic or pre-Buddhistic society in Tibet were more interested in the primitive aspects of living, which is eat, sleep, mate, that's it. So anything to accomplish that, to make it more smoother, they call that spiritual practice. Actually, it's not. Spiritual practice is to bring you to a state of compassion and omniscience. Not more women, more meat, more wine. That's not the purpose of spiritual practice. So any spiritual practice such as voodoo or, or shamanistic practice or these practices that increase anger, increase revenge, increase indulgence, it is not spiritual practice. It is practices that are labeled spiritual practice by people who are not in the know. It's not spiritual practice. Why? You know the definition of spiritual practice if I, if I, as I have explained to you earlier. So therefore, therefore, in these pre-Buddhistic times, Tibet is an old society, very old, and they have huge mountain ranges. You see, Tibet is almost the size of Australia, huge, and it's surrounded by mountains, and many are unexplored. And the practice there is basically shamanistic, pre-Buddhistic times, shamanistic practice. So what happens is magic is very strong, spirits are very strong, spirit practice is very strong. Don't think it's just in Thailand or Malaysia or Indonesia or Taiwan, everywhere. Every culture had it. Why? Because people's greed and desire and lust found a way to increase greed, desire, and lust. So therefore, when the Buddhist teachings were coming into Tibet, the great abbot Shantaraksita, the Indian Mahapandita, the Indian pure monk Shantaraksita, came to teach Buddhism. He had tremendous obstacles. The Pempo priests were against them. They did everything they can, from physical harm, from stopping sponsors, from stopping attendance, for, for a sabotaging time, spreading rumors, spreading negative um, um, words, by, uh, by twisting things around. And they also used magic to create hail. They also used magic to create spirits. They also used magic. They couldn't harm him. He was a pure monk. But they harmed the people trying to attend. So sometimes when they have a Dharma talk, hail will come, disrupt it. So that went on for many, many years. Finally, Shantaraksita said, I can't, I can't do it. I have the Dharma, but I don't have any occult powers to overcome these difficulties. I don't have. So what happens was, due to this situation, the great master, Padma Sambhava, Lord Guru Ramchi, the incredible scholar from India and Pandita was invited to Tibet. And when he came to Tibet, he went on a spiritual war with the mountain deities, with the mountain gods, with the temple priests. Instead of teaching Dharma for the first few years, he went into a spiritual war because there were so many obstacles and he was able to subdue them. He was able to subdue them and create the first monastery in Tibet, Samye. And the most ferocious, the most ferocious of those spirits was called Pehar, who is a Mongolian war god in origin, who came originally from Iran. A very ferocious spirit called Pehar. Three faces, six arms. 
and this spirit was went into a spiritual war with Padma Sambhava, was defeated, and his energy was contained inside a vase and housed inside Samyaya Monastery, guarded. And he was sworn to assist the growth of Dharma instead of the destruction. So he was one of the spirits that was sworn. And those are the local deities that were subjugated and sworn. Why? They create a lot of problems. A lot. He's just one of them. There are many others that were subjugated. These spirits are subjugated and they are controlled in Tibet and housed in certain temples because their energy is very strong. They will be more beneficial. So what happened if they are subjugated? So therefore, a lama of a high caliber can definitely subjugate them. So what happens is, those are deities in Tibet we can't pray to. They are tapped upon for their energy to help. You see, it's better that they help you than to create obstacles, but we don't pray to them. We don't take refuge in them. We don't prostrate to them. We give them offerings and, and things like that in order to make friendship, but we don't pray. Similarly, in the Indian tradition, they had very powerful Dharma protectors. They're not created by the Tibetans, you have to understand. They're not created by the Hindus, what people mistakenly believe. They are created and sworn powerful beings who swore their allegiance to Buddha. Some has sworn their allegiance even to the prior Buddha, way before India was even there, to the prior Buddha aeons ago, such as beings like Mahakala and Bandan Lamo, who have sworn their allegiance to the 1,000 Buddhas who will come and to assist those beings who take refuge in the Buddha. So what happens is, those great practices in India, India is a very old and ancient and superb culture, but they had the same problems that Tibet had, magic and problems and jealousy, just like any other country in the world, and it was very powerful, why? Because the people there have many different types of practices, very advanced in the ancient world. So they had Dharma protectors to guard and to help, to assist. Those Dharma protectors were instituted by Lord Buddha. Some were sworn by Lord Buddha or sworn in by one of Lord Buddha's acolytes or students in the future, such as Nagarjuna, such as Chandrakirti. So the protective practices that we have from Tibet are not developed from Tibet, are not. The protective practices that we have in Tibet do not come from Tibet were not started in Tibet. Even the ones that are protectors of Tibet, that are indigenous of Tibet, were started by Indian masters, such as the great Guru Padma Sambhava. Not by Tibetans, but they're maintained by Tibetans. And in the lineage of the Dharma protectors, such as Mahakala, such as Bendin Lamo, such as Kalarupa, such as Setrap or Veshavana, those are from India themselves. So the great Indian masters either brought them over or the Tibetan masters of that time went to India to receive the teachings and practice and meditations from the great masters of Bodhgaya or Nalanda. So let me state the source very clearly. The practice is from India. Enlightened Dharma protectors. So what happens is, look, the northern tradition, the southern tradition, all have one goal, Buddhahood. Have one boss, Lord Buddha. But if you have other beings that have sworn to Lord Buddha, to help and assist you, why not? Why not? And then if we believe in Lord Buddha's teachings to become enlightened, why do we believe that only Lord Buddha was the one enlightened, that nobody else after him become enlightened? If you believe that after Lord Buddha for 2,500 years, no one became enlightened or gained any type of powers or any type of advancement in their practice, then you have berated and you have degraded the Buddha. Why is it only Buddha became Buddha? Buddha taught for everyone to become a Buddha. So therefore, it's highly likely that many beings in the different countries also became enlightened. For example, Lama Tsongkhapa. And we're not just presupposition. There are much evidence to show that I won't get into detail at this time. Much evidence to show their state of mind and their enlightenment and how they, inverted commas, proved it. Many. One of the ways we can check is in their writings today. Lama Tsongkhapa has over 18 volumes of writings meditation, practices, subjects. His subjects are studied in all the great monasteries of Gandhin, Sera, Drepung, Tashi, Lumpo. To this day, his rituals, his practices, even the Kala Chakra given by the Dalai Lama all come from Lama Tsongkhapa. 
My point is what is we can check from his writings what kind of person he was. We didn't meet Einstein, but if we read his works, we can pretty much surmise he was a very intelligent person. So to say Einstein's not intelligent because we didn't get to see him would be ridiculous. So how do we examine Lama Tsongkhapa's qualities? By his works. How do we examine Lord Buddha's qualities? Because other people said he's Buddha? No, by reading his works. Even Lord Buddha, you didn't meet him. So a bunch of Thai and Tibetan monks tell you he's a Buddha, why would you believe it? You have to read his works, you have to meditate and see the results, then you will believe. Why would you believe? Because it's logical, clear. You can see it for yourself. Very, very clear. 